So we are live on YouTube, right? So in one minute we will start. Are you ready? Yes, yes. Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue and this is Pursue 14F which is Hematology General and Fundamental and we are streaming live from Savai Man Singh Medical College Jaipur via Kolkata a very interesting, very relevant and very important topic interpretation of hemogram, histogram and scatter plot and to talk on that we have a very very proficient person Dr. Nidish Sharma she is an MBBS from CMC Coimbatore and MD from PGI Chandigarh. Assistant Professor in SMS Medical College, Jaipur, Rajasthan. She is an alumni of CMC Coimbatore and obtained her MD in Pathology from PGI Chandigarh. Subsequent to which she did her senior residency there in Histopathology. Presently she is a faculty at the Advanced Hematology and HLA Lab at SMS Hospital, Jaipur. And actively involved in the diagnostic workup of HPLC flow cytometry, coagulation and HLA typing for kidney transplant, celiac disease, cross match for transplant. Her areas of interest include hematological malignancies, transplant pathology, which includes liver, kidney and bone marrow. She has multiple international and national publications and have authored several chapters in very prestigious books. Before I ask Dr. Sharma to take over, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please do not share your screen. With this, let me request Dr. Nidhi Sharma, ma'am, please share your screen and let's start. Okay, yes, sir. Thank yes. you so much, Dr. Nadine. Just press present now, your entire screen and your center of the screen and share. Yeah, perfectly fine. Just Thank make it full screen and just press okay. that hide thing so that everything is good okay. and nice. And if you want, you can change your pointer. That's up to your choice. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadeem, for all that help. And uh, good evening, everybody. I, is, I, I hope my screen is there. I'm audible. You are clearly audible, ma'am, and your screen is perfectly clear. We can Thank see you. you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Good evening to one and all. And uh, before I begin anything, I must take this opportunity to thank Dr. Nadeem for this opportunity for uh, allowing me to present my information or my understanding on this complicated topic of interpretation of hemogram or histogram. So we, before I begin the topic, I must say that I have been myself pursuing this pursue program which is so intel intelligently designed 
and that has got me so much interested uh, that you know every evening i'm just glued to the my laptop screen uh, listening to all the interesting lectures and having uh, this has really been an academic feast in this lockdown thank you dr nadeem for this academic feast uh, throughout the lockdown so now without wasting any further time we would uh, uh, straight away jump to the topic and uh, i'm go we are going to discuss the hemogram and histogram scatter plots so all of you are familiar with a paper like this which is called as the cpc print out and um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately uh, what we have been taught mostly is to concentrate on this half of the cpc uh, print out that means we are uh, very happy seeing all the indices and these numbers and uh, not paying much of the attention to this half in fact i have seen many of the cpc reports in which they just totally omit this part thinking that it is of no use of or of no importance to anybody to whom it is given but uh, this is not the story as you would uh, realize during this uh, presentation of mine uh, so uh, before uh, looking at what each histogram is uh, Uh, telling us i think it's very clear that we should make up our mind to this basic question that do we really need to look at the histograms you know they might seem like a complicated graph like thing and uh, is it something that really needs our attention i just give you one or two examples to prove a point and you would your uh, yourself reach to the answer to this question now you are, uh, you take for example instance uh, a 35 year old male who has presented to a clinical setting with peller and the clinician ordered uh, cbc and let's see the you know how as i told you most of the cbc reports will just have this half and you just got the indices or uh, some values in front of you which told you that he has a hemogram of 8.8 with an mcv of 63.6 so you know uh, just uh, straight away jumping to the diagnosis that you know this clearly looks like a microcytic hypochromic anemia and the clinician started him on uh, iron tablets and uh, waited for a response but when he came back after uh, you know the desired period of time for which he had the uh, hematinex he failed to show any uh, response what could have been the reason now the reason is very clear once we start seeing the entire report it's the same report but now we have the histogram here with us so what does this histogram is telling you it is telling you that there are two kinds of population and the the mean of which came something around microcytic number and you just thought of it as a plain and deficiency anemia and treated on one part but he might also have another population which which could be a megaloblastic anemia or a sideroblastic anemia here that we are dealing with and because we have not tried to uh, treat that part of his anemia he has failed to show uh, the desired kind of response so that means uh, um, a, a patient uh, who is having megaloblastic anemia developing iron deficiency anemia and but that that the number of cells is so less that it is not reflecting in your numerical data is a kind of patient that they are going to pick up once we start you know referring to the histograms and um, uh, and also otherwise you know a patient who is, who is having a normocytic normochromic kind of anemia as in polycythemia or something develops a very uh, small fraction of cells in early iron deficiency kind of picture and showing you a small shoulder of microcytic red cells visible only in a histogram but clearly missed on the mean indices that we uh, get to see so yes the answer to this question is yes we really need to look at the rbc platelet or you know wbc histograms to come to a more conclusive picture of what is happening in the blood of the marrow so now beginning with uh, the basic introduction of what exactly the histogram is and what it is telling us so histogram is a graphic representation of collection of data which is based on two important uh, calculations one is the cell size and the other is the cell number and what is the variation in size and number that is happening in a large number of cell that is uh, uh, that is depicted in a histogram this is also known by another term which is the frequency of distribution curve so let's forget about the cbc histograms and just talk of histogram in general so what what are the components of a histogram that you see in in any other area so the histogram will have a tactile telling you what it is depicting it will have an x axis it will have the bars which will be each event that it is recording 
it will have a y axis and to give it a proper meaning the histogram should have a legend which would tell you that what this histogram is talking about or what is the relationship between the x and y which is being talked about when we talk of the cbc blood, blood reports the histograms uh, uh, are plotted something like that you know so you know the uh, for any cell to be labeled as a particular cells for example as rbc or platelet or wbc it is defined by two kind of discriminators that are made on the uh, histograms so for any any cell population that we are going to describe we are giving it a lower discriminator or also called as the ld and we are going to give it an upper discriminator which is called as the ud as in this case you can see i have uh, taken some population of my interest and uh, put it it within two discriminators lower and upper and i have set my discriminator between 2 and 250 femtoliters so any population that i am going to count and that is coming between this size of 2 to 250 is going to be depicted in my histogram so i have used my x axis to depict the size and i have used my y axis to depict depict the number of cells that are i'm going to count uh, within this size range now this lower discriminator and upper discriminator are clearly flexible i can move it around from 2 to say 30 i can move it from 2 to say 5 and similarly this upper discriminator can be moved around so when i am going to look at any histogram these are the first two points that are going i am going to check that where are my lower and upper discriminators lying which are defining my population of interest the second thing that i am going to look is whether my graph whatever graph i have got from the histogram whether both its end points are touching the baseline this is the most important in, uh, information that you are going to grasp uh, grasp once you realize that whether this is touching or not touching the base the third point that you need to consider is whether you got only a single peak in this histogram or you are getting multiple peaks two or even more and this is what you are going to see so uh, this is all this is going to become more clear once we see the subsequent histograms but this is just a basic understanding the point that we are grasping at this point is look at the ld and the ud look at both the ends touching the baseline look at the number of peaks that you are getting and yes as we use in any um, graphs we have this slide looks very busy that we have so many statistical de definitions most of which you might not remember but because because they will be easily depicted in your numerical data and therefore uh, i'll make this slide a little simpler in this way is that whatever graphs that you have got we have to see that the population the number of cells within one standard deviation is 68.3% of your entire population if your graph uh, graph has come uh, to the shape of a typical gaussian curve which mostly happens in case of rbcs 95.5% of your entire population should be within two standard deviation and 99.7 of it comes in three standard deviation so a bell shaped graph or a gaussian graph is what we get if we uh, have a normal rbc distribution so uh, the basic utility of a histogram in addition to your or uh, in uh, uh, even if you don't look at your indices is that it gives a more meaningful and quickly understood uh, data it helps you to look at points peaks valleys and even line of frequency curve and you don't only get to uh, see individual center but you also get to see the spread of the data now we are going to look at each of the uh, histograms in detail and as each as we are going to talk about each cell we are also going to look, look a little bit into how these histograms are being meet though this is in itself a very big topic and i would not be able to go in much detail but i would be able to give you a very brief gist of what exactly is hap happening in the analysis so the analyzer basically has three kinds of blocks the one block which is used entirely for detection of hemoglobin using whatever method that particular analyzer is using most commonly it's a non cyanide hemoglobin sls kind of method or something else then you have an rbc detector block which will take care of two populations one is rbcs and the other is platelets and there will be a third block which will just uh, concentrate on counting and giving the histogram of about the wbc let's first begin with the rbc detector block which is going to uh, give you uh, the information about what is happening with your rbcs and platelets 
and the technology which the rbc detector block uses most commonly is called as electronic impedance we all are very much aware of this wallace coulter principle uh, of what he taught to us that you know if we allow um, a current to pass between two kind of electrodes if you put two electrodes and there is a current flowing between them uh, which is a good conductor of electricity and then something or some cell if it passes through this which causes a break in this current and as soon as this cell passes you will have an impulse being generated for this particular cell the height of this cell corresponding to the size of uh, the cell that has passed now let us look in a, a, once again see if you have another cell which is passing the current gets blocked and you have another uh, impulse or another uh, uh, pulse wave which is generated so what happens and that the height of this pulse and the number of these pulses that are being generated are counted in the impedance principle and a very raw kind of data is plotted by the uh, analyzer in which each individual pulse height of each cell that has passed is recorded by the analyzer now this data is very raw and uh, beyond any uh, you know uh, meaningful uh, thing that can be intercepted and this is finely fitted into a log distribution curve and a cumulative distribution curve helps us to give rise to a histogram of what we find we see now one important error that can occur here is the coincidence error as you might very well think that you know what would happen if more than two cells pass simultaneously and this kind of error is very much uh, Some, some something that is thought of by the analyzer and therefore all the analyzers have something called as an integrated uh, coincidence corrected uh, software within them and this error uh, is also taken care of by uh, this this error is also taken care of by another principle called hydrodynamic focusing which uh, makes sure that all the cells are passing through a single streamline and therefore no two cells get to pass together but in your histograms if the coincidence is still there you will find that at the end of your graph because this is the larger size when two cells pass simultaneously their their volume will be much more you will get a small peak like this at the end of the graph and if you get such a kind of uh, peak in all of your samples you should be uh, thinking of something like a coincidence error that is happening in your machine and you need to check on your instrument once again otherwise the hydrodynamic focusing He, uh, takes care of this coincidence uh, error this also takes care of another kind of error because if you if you remember that uh, uh, the cell when it is passing through the electrode if the cell is very near to the electrode it will give a very uh, impression that the cell has a very high volume because a very uh, peak peak size of that pulse is very high this is called as something like an m uh, m kind of an impulse if the cell passes near the wall hydrodynamic focusing will also take care of this that no uh, no cell passes very close to the wall and therefore such an uh, error is taken care of so after the machine has done all that sort of things this is how we get a normal rbc on a platelet kind of curve so just a breather here for you know the undergraduates uh, let us see what is the first cell that we are going to discuss in detail this is a mature cell which is very flexible has oval biconcave discs the diameter generally lying between 6.2 to 8.2 this is a nucleate that means lacking any nucleus so we are going to first discuss the rbc histogram so uh, what information is needed to create an erythrocyte histogram if you have absorbed of, of about what i have been uh, talking till now whether it is the cell volume or the cell number whether it is the cell size and the cell complexity whether you are talking about nucleus size or cellular density whether you are talking about cell forward scatter and cell side scatter well b c and d are features you know cell complexity what is inside the nucleus is something that you will be more concerned with when you once you are talking about a nuclear cell that is the wbc kind of population our rbc is an a nucleate cell and just the cell volume and the number of cells is enough for uh, the analyzer to create an histogram so answer here would be a that you know you just need the cell volume and the relative cell number to give you an erythrocyte histogram So as I uh, told you, the RBCs and platelets are taken care of in a single chamber, which is called as the RBC chamber uh, mostly. And uh, if you plot all these cells in a single uh, 
single uh, graph which has an x and a y axis and now we are putting our uh, lower and upper discriminator uh, if uh, the analyzer usually puts a lower discriminator of 25 to 30 femtoliters for rpcs and the upper discriminator is somewhere around 250 femtoliters whereas platelets are uh, made to recognize by any cell which has a lower discriminator of 2 femtoliters and an upper discriminator of 25 uh, uh, femtoliters so speaking very simply all the cells are passing through the rbc aperture and you have sorted it in this way is that any cell which is passing uh, and is lying between 2 to 25 will be called as a platelet by the analyzer and any cell which is passing between 225 and 250 femtoliters lying between this size volume will be recognized as red blood cell uh, by the uh, analyzer and that is how it will put so uh, and as i said this this will be your uh, lower end of the graph and this will be the upper uh, this will be the end on the other side and you have to make sure that both these ends are there resting on the x axis you look at the number of peaks look at your lower discriminator whether it is set right this is a flexible dis dis uh, discriminator and if you running many samples in your lab and you feel you know it is more a little more uh, shifted towards left and then it 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 suits you better so that that flexibility at the analyzer allows you so the question here arises is what is the counter doing with all the wbcs so wbcs are cells which are usually beyond this point larger than this and uh, don't they interfere with the platelet or the rbcs if they are you know smaller in size you have small lymphocytes the answer here is no this is because when we are talking about uh, rbcs uh, we are talking about a cell whose count is somewhere in millions but when we talk about wbcs the count is in thousands and something which is in thousands will not statistically uh, interfere in a count which is in millions so the machine does not need to uh, worry about the wbcs count in general when it is doing the but yes you need to be cautious when your wbc counts uh, is is really really high and you feel you know even a small number of this might be mingling into the rbc and in those cases you may get a false high wbc count and an and even false indices in that case and there have been such case reports where they have actually documented and um, uh, Uh, this in literature that hyperleukocytosis usually interferes with the red blood cell count and in such cases you will get a hump somewhere at the end of this graph and this tells you that you know you know need to go back and look at your uh, slide and whatever rbc count you that you have given might not be it might be an overestimation now what are the rbc histograms in different conditions now that we have very well understood how it looks in the normal conditions consider a very uh, simple situation first that whatever graph we were seeing line between 20 and 250 something like this has now shifted entirely towards left so shifting towards left means is now that we are talking about a population whose size is much less than what we expect to see so uh, one important point in interpreting histograms is that whatever graph that you get always try to interpolate or extrapolate the uh, the normal histogram somewhere around this graph so that you know what exactly the kind of change that has occurred so i would plot my normal somewhere like this and therefore the entire graph has shifted towards histogram so basically what i am dealing with is a population which is microcytic in nature it has less size as what we would normally expect to see and therefore my differentials would include any cause of microcytosis that i can think of it can be iron deficiency anemia it can be a beta thalassemia trait or a small population of a sideroblastic anemia so let's see how it looks now look at this graph so it has clearly shifted towards left and i know that i am dealing with a microcytic kind of picture let's check what the indices have to check say so for this patient the indices is a hemoglobin of 8.5 and my mcv is 61.7 which is supporting my histogram also that it is a microcytic kind of anemia that i am dealing with and i would label it as a case of iron deficiency anemia now look at these two graphs just concentrate here so clearly what is happening is that my graph has shifted to the left so i am dealing with a microcytic population and what is happening in this case 
again my graph has shifted to the left and again i am dealing with microcytic uh, population but then if you look at these two graphs which both depict, depict microcytosis do these graphs look same there's something that is strikingly different in these two graphs look at the width of these two graphs now this graph is much wider and this graph is narrow as as compared to this and uh, though it is uh, because it is at a lower magnification if you tend to look at the number of rbcs it is 2.84 in this patient and this is much much high 6.39 so two points of difference so we have a microcytic picture which has this this width is called as rdw we'll be just talking about it in detail in subsequent slides so a microcytic kind of picture with a more width a more distribution width and a less rbc count a microcytic kind of picture with less distribution width and uh, higher rbc count so let us know what is that rdw here is come to around 32.9 when the normally somewhere around 10 to 16 and here the rdw is quite close to uh, the what is the normal so that means if we if we remember these are the basic point of differences between iron deficiency anemia and a beta thalassemia trait so the graph above is that of iron deficiency anemia because iron deficiency anemia will have more of anisocytosis you will have some very small some very large and all kind of cells and the rbc count is not that high because the iron is not there in the marrow and therefore this this just on the basis of this histogram you can say that you are dealing with iron deficiency and in this microcytosis whereas because the rdw is normal and the rbc count is much raised just on the basis of this histogram you can say suggest that this could be a uh, beta thalassemia trait and advise an hplc there to confirm or uh, uh, the screening for beta thalassemia trait now just to the opposite of what we have seen till now now the graph has shifted towards the right so my normal would come somewhere here and now the entire graph has shifted to the right and because we are talking about size on this axis a shift to this side means now we are dealing with cells which are larger in size as compared to what is seen in the normal population so i would think of all the causes of macrocytosis in such a case whenever the uh, graph is shifted towards right and the causes would include uh, macroblastic anemia which could be b12 or a folate deficiency liver diseases thyroid disorders and so on now here also the the amount of shift that has happened to the right is a clear indication of whether you are talking about an early stage of megaloblastic anemia or an advanced stage of megaloblastic anemia so if you look at this graph the, the if the normal somewhere being here it has shifted a slight bit and you look at the mcv is coming somewhere around 101.7 so you are talking about a very early uh, b12 kind of deficiency here but if you look here the graph has shifted so much as compared to this and look at your mcv now it has reached 108.7 so what is happening in your indices is actually very clearly depicted as if you are looking at a slide in your histogram and you can very confidently say between the stages of these kind, different kinds of macroblastic anemia and more shifts look at this mcv it is now reach 144 and look at the width of this graph and you have you you are now it is almost reaching beyond 250 fm to liter so that means you are now getting uh, megaloblastic megaloblasts in circulation now look at the third condition what is wrong with this histogram so now now again we are just trying to draw a normal here and a normal would come somewhere around here we see that the lower discriminator has failed to touch the baseline so what is wrong what is happening in this so what is happening here is that you know there are some small cells which are going towards this size or maybe there are some larger cells which are coming if you remember our platelet histogram would be somewhere here some some cells from the platelet histogram which are larger and merging into this side and some rbc cells which are becoming so small that they are going to this side uh so such a condition has actually a few differential diagnoses that we need to consider so number one it could be small particles of noise just the background noise from the instrument if it is so high that you know it is merging with this population here and therefore not allowing this uh, the the lower discriminator end of the graph to touch the baseline so when you are thinking of uh, uh, noise or something you know my background noise is mostly happen if you are using uh, reagents or your uh, whatever uh, 
controls etc that you are using they are not uh, they have they have expired and you know they have uh, with, within them some contamination now and therefore when you use such such reagents usually you you can get this kind of picture otherwise you can think that there are small rbcs which have actually fragmented and now they are actually smaller than 25 femtoliters and therefore they are merging into the platelet population and that could cause such a picture microspherocytes circulating nucleated rbcs rbcs which are non lysed and you know they are still there but smaller in size some elliptocytes or platelets which are larger in size called macrothrombocytes platelet clumps circulating bacteria or some parasitic organisms are all the differentials that you have to consider in such a kind of graph so as i told you background uh, uh, noise can easily be checked if you look at the expiry date of your reagents now look at this kind of scenario what is happening here so as i said what we need to check the lower discriminator ends whether they are touching the graphs and the number of peaks so we have got two peaks here and then this end you will see that it's not clearly touching the graph so clearly we have one population which is microcytic and you know even smaller rbcs which are merging with platelet graph what could this second peak result due to now again uh, there could be many conditions which could cause such a bimodal histogram so consider a case of pure iron deficiency anemia and now we have started him on treatment and some of the rbcs are now moving towards normal sites and therefore but there are still some which are microcytic so this is the most common this kind of picture that you would result in an iron deficiency anemia on treatment or you consider it that you know this is uh, post iron treatment now moving towards helping megaloblastic anemia and not fully fully fledged now but you know you are getting that second peak there a sideroblastic anemia a hemolytic anemia a warm agglutination in an iron deficiency anemia or a patient who is on erythropoietin induced in erythropoiesis homozygous hemoglobinopathies can also cause this kind of picture and a mixture of emh kind like early myelofibrosis could give you this bimodal graph and a very rare constitutional chromosomal translocation t1122 can cause this kind of picture so two populations means if when you see this kind of thing on your histogram you really need to screen for these two populations on your pbf and try to find out what exactly these two populations are but if you just depend upon your indices when uh, which is uh, depicting you an mcv of 63.6 you are clearly going to miss this other population and unless you know you really look carefully on the slide so just don't depend on the indices alone look try to look at what the histogram is trying to tell you Now look at this condition. So we are going our point check. The lower discriminator has touched the graph well, but what is happening here at the upper discriminator? Instead of this point touching here uh, uh, to the base to the x-axis, it has shown another hump here. Now this kind of a condition is actually very critical. As I said, that you know clearly you have uh, a cell population which is larger than what you see here. now in this scenario if you if you look at your rbc count it is actually alarmingly low not the normal being 4.5 to 5.5 and we are getting an rbc count of 1.32 a look at his uh, indices the mcv is showing you 118.2 a macrocytic kind of picture mch again 38.6 but mchc look at the mchc the mchc has failed to go in line with the mcv and mch the rbc count is alarmingly low now such a condition if you get where mcv mcs mcsc are not in line rbc is count is alarmingly low you must think of a condition called as cold agglutinin disease wherein agglutination has occurred to the rbc thus causing a low count and because they have agglutinated but what should lie here has become larger and you know they have stuck together they become larger in size and they have created their own hump there now uh, if you are thinking of cold gluten disease here if you warm up the sample and you know try to run it again maybe you will find that this hump has disappeared and a normal graph has appeared so try to consider uh, the uh, the underlying causes of cold gluten disease there and uh, suggest it to the clinician so that a necessary workup is taken there 
So let's take a breather here. Uh, which of the parameter does the self counted derive from a histogram or scattergram? So we have looked at so many RBC histograms till now. Can you think of the parameter which is derived, which anal for which the analyzer depends totally on the histogram to come to a value? Whether it is a relative monocyte count, whether it is the erythrocyte count, or the mean cell volume, or the hematocrit. So as I said, the the, uh, the the peak of the curve, the mean of the peak of the curve that we uh, use is used to calculate the mean cell volume or the MCV. So the answer to this question would be that, that the mean cell volume is calculated totally from the RBC histogram. And not only mean cell uh, volume, we have some other calculations which are done from the RBC histograms. The most uh, uh, important of that, that being RDW or the RDW. RBC distribution width. So what this uh, parameter is going to look at is you know how your RBC distribution, how wide it is. And two kinds of RDWs are calculated by the machine. The one is calculated at one standard deviation width and divided by the mean cell volume. And the other is just arbitrarily taken at the 20% uh, factor, 20% frequency curve that you know what is the width at this curve. So whatever is the difference between this and this width that is given to you as the RDW SD. So your RDW CV generally lies between 11.5 to 14.5. It may vary a little with the kind of instrument that you're using. And RDW SD generally lies between 39 to 47 femtoliter. To tell you in a little detail how this is done, so you imagine this is your RBC histogram and when we are talking of one standard deviation, we are talking about whatever population is lying within this shaded area. This population width, we are dividing it by the mean cell volume and this will give you the RDWC. Whereas when you're talking about the RDW SD, we are just looking at the 20% frequency. What is the width of the graph that you're getting at this frequency and this would give you an RDW SD. So you have two kind of values, you have RDW CV and you have RDW SD. Now consider this case, you have a patient who is showing you an MCV of 130 femtoliters. The RDW CV is 16.5, I told you the normal lies somewhere between 11.5 to 14.5 and the RDW SD is 88 when the normal is somewhere around 47. So CV is only marginally raised. But SD, the, the, the degree of change in SD is much high. So can you think of what, why it's such a discrepancy in the two, the two uh, RDW types has occurred? And uh, why in such a case, when the discrepancy is so much, it is very important to look at your RBC histogram or cytogram. So as you will remember, we talked about this, that RDW CV is something which is calculated depending upon a value which is called as MCV. So now in any conditions, like in this case where the patient had an MCV of 130 femtoliter, in any condition, when the MCV is uh, changed a lot, you are changing the denominator. And also because uh, the RDW is, uh, CVs only consider whatever population or whatever uh, kind of uh, anisocytosis is occurring between one standard deviation and not looking beyond it. Whereas if you look at 20% distribution curve, we are, we are open to two standard deviations, three de standard deviations and any kind of anisocytosis. So the degree of anisocytosis that RDW CV uh, uh, tells us about is much less and it is much more affected by your MCV. Therefore, in conditions in which you are, uh, you are having a large number of microcytic or macrocytic uh, population, RDW CV becomes a little less uh, reliable as compared to RDW ST. Therefore, in all such conditions, it would be much, much more uh, uh, useful to depend upon your RDW ST to look upon you, what is the degree of anisocytosis that is occurring. In cases in which you have a very high degree of microcytosis or a very high degree of macrocytosis. Or in other words, if I would simply put it, in all those cases in which MCV is altered much beyond uh, normal and uh, uh, RDW CV is therefore not cal uh, correctly calculated and we should not depend upon RDW CV. So uh, a breather here where we have talked about the RBC histograms and uh, you would say that this is such a simple question that I have put that what is the normal platelet count 
but believe me most of the instances this is the simplest question that that would give you sleepless nights because the clinicians often often doubt the counts given by your platelets and therefore they ask you to check and recheck again whether whatever counts you, you have given to them by your analyzer is correct or not so after showing you a few histograms and after you understand them you would be in a position to tell them very confidently whether the count given by your histogram is right or not so usually the normal platelet count is 1 lakh to 4 lakh and how we can looking at the histogram tell whether the hist uh, analyzer has counted them correctly or not is what i'm going to tell you now so now we are concentrating on the half of the uh, histograms which is lying between 2 to uh, 25 30 femtoliter the other half we have discussed is the rbc population now unlike the rbc histogram the platelet histogram is always a little left skewed this is because we generally have most of the platelets lying between this size and very few of them will be of giant size like size like big line between 20 to 30 femtoliters so it's not a typical gaussian curve that you get as in case of rbcs when you're talking about platelets so lower discriminator here is fixed at 2 the upper discriminator fixed at ld again we are checking for the same things whether they both the ends are touching the graphs whether the number of peaks that we are getting are single or multiple consider this graph what happens when you see your platelet graph and the peak that you see get to see is much higher than what you get to see normal in such a inst instances we clearly have to think of a, a high platelet count a high platelet count would usually produce a very high peak in case of platelets let's look at this graph uh, graph and you know if you look at the indices a platelet count has Somewhere, somewhere between 466. Uh, so, for like 6,000 is the count in this case. Now, uh, the method again here is the same. If this is your graph, try to imagine how a normal graph would have looked. So, this dashed line tells you the normal uh, graph. And if your height is more than what the normal would have looked, so you're clearly dealing with thrombocytosis if if both the ends of your graph are touching the baseline so if you have generated this machine and your uh, your patient your clinician calls you back you know whether he, this count given by your platelet whether it's the right count and you clear uh, just go back and look at your histogram and you see both the ends clearly touching the x-axis you can be very confident in telling them that you know there has been no population merge and that the platelets have been very well enumerated and yes you're dealing with a true thrombocytosis here Similarly, the, uh, the other side, uh, the opposite condition, when the graph fails to achieve any height, you are you're dealing with a case of thrombocytopenia here. So, this has failed to touch the, uh, you know, gain any height here. And if you look at your counter, it is giving a count of 3000. Now, whether this is a true thrombocytopenia or not, again, look back at your graph and see whether both the ends are touching your x axis. The, pop the plated population has been counted very well by the analyzer, and this is a true thrombocytopenia. And the simplest method is yes, this, your normal graph is coming like this, and you try to put the normal graph is coming dashed and your patient graph is coming like this. It is failed to achieve the desired height and you are dealing with the truth from the cytopenia here. So what is happening in this case? So the graph has failed to achieve the high, kind of height it, it wanted to and but at the same time you know it has failed the upper discriminator has failed to touch the x-axis the population is going here and merging somewhere and trying to reach the rbc population now there is a big gap here so what could have been the uh, causes now um, when you try to look at the causes here the first and the uh, most important thing that i would do is go back and look at the rbc graph when it is uh, not merging here, I need to see whether my RBC graph has touched the baseline on both the sides or not and whether its width is normal or not. Now, in such a uh, scenario, I see no change in my RBC graph. It's just that I am dealing with some platelets which are perhaps larger than size and what we normally see. So, if I if I go in this case and look at my slide and I will see uh, platelets like this. Clearly, I am dealing with giant platelets. Now, giant platelets, because they are larger in size, they would not fit into the upper discriminator criteria that we have set and our graph will hence fail to touch the baseline. So, dealing with the giant platelets here, 
uh, and when the num the number is more in the uh, slide, you know that the thrombocytopenia that your uh, analyzer has documented is not true, and the true platelet count would be actually a much more because these uh, the larger cells are failed to be recognized as platelets by your analyzer because your discriminator has been set at a at a size limit, which the patient is now not following. now here i would take like to discuss that you know sometimes the kind of anticoagulant also matters and it's not always giant platelet and sometimes you know there are edta induced clumps which makes the platelet look larger in size and you have such get you get such big clumps and again you have many platelet clumps your platelet will fail to touch the bottom line on the x axis on the upper discriminator set and sometimes when you go back to slides and see those large clumps you would suggest to your clinician to try to send you a sample on a different anticoagulant maybe heparin or something and just changing the anticoagulant would give you the true platelet count here Now look at this scenario. The x-axis LD has touched the bottom line, but on the upper discriminator side, the platelet has, uh, has failed to touch the bit, uh, bottom line. And as I, as I told you before, I am going to go back to my RBC graph and look here. Now, now here my RBC graph does not look normal. So it is shifted a little towards left. The width has increased, and I am also seeing a hump which is trying to merge into my RBC population. So now clearly here I am dealing with a case which has uh, more RDW, and therefore I would be would not be surprised if I get to see many micro RBCs or RBC fragments here. and uh, you know just to confirm this on the indices also if i look at the aortic count this would be high in this case telling you that some hemolytic event has occurred and therefore these micro rbcs or fragmented rbcs that are coming here they are merging back into the platelet graph and that is why you have now some rbcs coming here and whatever platelet count here has been given again might not be true and there might be some uh, rbcs mixed in this kind of graph so clearly just by looking at the rdw or the rbc graph you can uh, comment to some extent that you know the thrombocytosis that you are showing uh, that your analyzer is showing is not true and has an admixed population of fragmented rbcs or micro spheros uh, mixed with them and that is causing your high platelet count so uh, that means the platelet number is the most important thing that any clinician is uh, interested in whenever he sends a cbc concerning the platelet because you know many important treatment decisions are based upon this and therefore uh, the method that we have discussed before the impedance method that the analyzer uses for uh, counting your rbcs and platelets might not be such a good thing in conditions where you know that we have interference with platelets because impedance means any particle which is coming the cell is, the counter is or the analyzer is producing a pulse therefore uh, just by uh, counting by the impedance method the uh, platelet count or the platelet block would have inability in distinguishing platelets from other particles that overlap in the size range of platelets and therefore the analyzer has more than one ways of counting the platelet the ways that we have known or discussed till now is called as platelet i or platelet impedance we also have another method where in laser optical comes into picture and therefore now we are looking at the platelet particle and uh, using some side scatter at high and low angles and the platelet counted by using uh, properties of platelets like in this way is called as platelet o so consider any any situation in which you have you are uh, you are expecting that there are fragments of rbcs which are merging in your platelet population you can always set your instrument mode to platelet o and in such conditions platelet o would be much better uh, parameter than platelet i now the histogram or the, uh, the graph of the platelet o would look something like this wherein you know the normal size platelets are on the bottom and the the um, larger platelets are they are on the top a normal platelet count would have would look something like this you know there would be very few cells on in the larger platelet uh, area and most of the cells would be in a normal platelet area if you remember that our platelet graph is a little left skewed because most of the cells are little uh, smaller in size so this will help us in interpreting the platelet o graphs that i would be showing you on now the counter uses is called as the platelet f where you know you are using fluorescence 
platelets also as in the platelets and the platelet f graph would clearly separate the rbc population from your fluorescent stain uh, platelet population in addition this graph would give you a new parameter which is being talked about a lot which is the immature platelet fraction because the the immature platelets will be a little larger in cell and they'll become somewhere here they scatter would be here and this entire population will be labeled by the graph by the analyzer as the immature platelet fraction now uh, concentrate on the upper part of this uh, picture or this uh, so this this is the platelet count which is done by the impedance method or platelet i we have just discussed these two kind of graph where it has failed to touch the baseline and we have discussed the two kind of condition which could uh, cause this the giant platelets or the uh, the fragmented or the microcytic rbcs now when we look at the same graph in platelet o method we find that you know we don't have that difficulty because it clearly separates the rbc fragment means here and uh, you know it 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 will clearly uh, separate the giant platelets very well here so if you consider this case where the uh, graph has failed to touch the baseline the number of fragments in the giant platelet side is less but you get a lot of smaller size uh, these are the blue colored are the rbcs a, a large number of smaller size rbcs but now they are clearly demarcated as is not happening in the platelet impedance method so by platelet o you 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 get a much better count you get a much clearer picture similarly giant platelets here would be shown here in this pattern as we have just seen the normal that you know they are much increased and there are hardly any smaller sized rbcs in this kind of picture so such a graph we can say by looking at the platelet o graph has resulted from giant platelets in circulation and um, the same plots you know uh, in in our lab we try to put the platelet i and platelet o in the same uh, paper so that it becomes very easier for us to understand like this platelet graph failed to touch the x axis here and when i looked at the platelet o what i see is that there are so many microcytes and you know there are uh, hardly any uh, giant platelets here and uh, confidently say that we are dealing with some fragmented rbcs here and uh, whereas in this case again you know if you if you look at platelet f you see la large number of immature platelet fractions here and you know there would be a large number of circulating uh, giant platelets here again so now let's consider this case it's a, she's a 28 year old female and uh, two patients Uh, both almost of the same age and uh, having a low pl low platelet count one having 31000 and one having 27000 let's look at their uh, platelet graphs almost the same kind of picture you know it is uh, showing so many peaks and it has failed to touch the baseline in both the cases in on the y axis now let's look at the platelet f here Uh, and the platelet have f here so as i told you based on the number of cells that we uh, get here on the analyzer we calculate a, a parameter which is known as the immature platelet fraction the immature platelet fraction in the above graph is 4.3 when the normal is usually between 0.9 to 5.4 whereas in in this patient we are getting an immature platelet fraction of 52.9 so what is happening in in both these cases so thrombocytopenia with a normal ipf and thrombocytopenia with a much raised ipf so ipf is something that is telling you what is happening in the marrow so uh, clearly the thrombocytopenia is uh, broadly divided into two kinds of uh, causes one is when there is increased destruction in the periphery but the marrow is doing a good job and there is uh, no problem there in the marrow and the second is when the marrow fails to you know try to keep the pace with the peripheral destruction or with the peripheral counts and there is a decreased platelet production in the marrow and here you are you know talking about some problems which are happening in the marrow so if your ipf is good and it is high you can be very sure that your marrow megakeratocytes will be normal but with the kind of counts here if your ipf fails to rise you know that there are some problems there you can could be dealing with a kind of a megakeratocytic kind of thrombocytopenia there and this uh, ipf actually helps you kind of think of what is happening in the marrow without actually doing a aspirin now consider another case of thrombocytopenia in a female and uh, if you if you see this kind of a picture if you remember the uh, picture i showed you below uh, we uh, what we were expecting is that you know most of the platelets would be small size and concentrated here and very few would be uh, on the large platelet area whereas what is happening here is that you know most of the platelets you know they are uniformly distributed 
throughout the population. Now, such a case usually means that we are dealing with a genetic condition wherein the uh, patient uh, is actually not a, even a patient. You know, he has a, a, a physiological kind of platelet which are all giant. They, are, they will function really very well. And, you know, we should not be scared by a low platelet count. Whereas, um, if, if in the same picture, if you get uh, a picture like this, that most of it is uh, concentrated in the small cell area, you hardly get to see any in the giant platelet area. So, that means your IPF is low, you are dealing with thrombocytopenia. In such a case, the bone marrow has failed to produce a thrombocytopenia here. Whereas, you know, in conditions like ITP, the bone marrow is good and you know you will get a lot of giant, uh, giant platelets here in, in, in accordance with your platelet count. So, just a look at the platelet O graph would help you differentiate in these kinds of uh, different kind of conditions of uh, causes of thrombocytopenia. And just like in um, RBC, the plated histogram also calculates some values which are used in different conditions. Again, we are uh, looking at the width at the 20% frequency and this is called as the platelet distribution width. What, as, uh, what we have in uh, RBC, the RBC dist distribution width. Here we will talk about the platelet distribution width. Uh, here, because the large cell ratio or the larger platelets are usually less as compared to the normal size platelet and therefore just looking at the larger effect and in contrast to the total platelet count gives us a parameter which is known as PLCR and the normally it should lie between 15 to 35 patient and if, if you have an increase in this proportion it would mean that you are dealing with platelet clumps, giant platelets, microerythrocytes or fragmented RBCs. So uh, these are the two most commonly used and again the mean height here would give you the MPV or the mean platelet volume. So, uh, with this we have finished the RBCs and the uh, platelet histograms and now we'll be dealing with the WBC histograms. So, um, as I told you before, the WBC is a different block and a different detector is used here and therefore uh, we, are, we are going to use principles other than the impedance here and the principle with which the analyzer does the WBC count uh, uses uh, a kind of uh, you know lytic region which would first lyse all the red blood cells and now so you have a limited number of WBC cells only to uh, deal with. But then because you have used a lytic reagent, uh, something which has harmed the cells, even the uh, WBC uh, outer wall is lysed and what is left is only a thin ring of cytoplasm. And therefore what WBCs you see in your peripheral smear is not what the analyzer sees because now you have altered with its uh, structure. So you see if the normal WBC was li like this, now the analyzer has used a uh, lysing reagent to basically kill the RBCs but that has also had its effect on WBC and therefore only a thin rim of cytoplasm just remains and we are going to mostly concentrate on the nucleus. So if you are uh, before lysing uh, your largest cell uh, is always the monocyte they are followed by your neutrophils, eosinophils and all this uh, you, you see that after lysing this changes a lot and now neutrophil becomes your largest cell uh, in the uh, cell population which is there in your analyzer and your lymphocyte is the smallest cell here monocyte, basophil and eosinophil are almost the same size and neutrophil is, becomes the largest cell. So if now we try to plot the same kind of graph that we used for RBC and platelet. This is our x-axis and this is our pipes axis and we will put our lower discriminators and upper discriminators here and uh, again we need to put two more discriminators somewhere here which are called as rows T1 and T2 they would be caused and by that we are defining or we are telling the analyzer you know to call what population what. So whatever is lying between your lower discriminator and your T1 would be called as lymphocyte by the uh, analyzer. Whatever population is lying between T1 and T2 would be called the monocytes, basophils and eosinophils. So we are talking about a three-part analyzer here and I'll tell you a, a more detail about what happens in a five-part and other higher-end instruments. And whatever is happening between T2 and the upper discriminator would be labeled as neutrophil by the uh, analyzer. So uh, just the same uh, points to keep in mind that we kept in mind while we were analyzing our RBC and platelets. We need to show 
that you know the ends of the graph they are touching well on the x axis and any problem there would mean that you know uh, if suppose if this end fails to touch the x axis that means you know there's a smaller population coming from this side which is merging here and not letting this start from the base and if this fails to uh, touch here that means there are cells larger than neutrophil in circulation which are not letting your neutrophil graph to touch in uh, your base and you know you can have different peaks here and it is uh, not coming to normal you know suppose if there is a peak here that means you are having more of either monocytosis basophilia or eosinophilia that you are dealing with if this neutrophil peak would be much higher that means you are dealing with neutrophilia here and therefore you can kind of check that whatever differential is been given by your analyzer whether it is going whether it is going in hand with your histograms or not so let's look at a few cases so this is what i told you how just so you just picture this in your mind that you know your limbs your basal e mono eo and neutrophil are lying somewhere like this on your x and y axis uh some analyzers also use these terms of f1 f2 and f3 you know the population which lies between ld and t1 would be called as f1 that line between t1 and t2 would be f2 that means that includes the eosinophils monocytes and you know your promyelos myelos would also come in this population and uh, the one which is after t t t2 till your upper discriminator would be called fc which would mostly comprise of your neutrophils so this is how it is the lower discriminator the upper discriminator the t1 the t2 and this is your f1 population lying between ld and t1 this is f2 between t1 and t2 and this is f3 between t2 and the upper discriminator so a lower discriminator has failed to touch that means you have you are getting some larger platelets which are trying to merge in here your rbcs have failed to lyse and you know there are uh, lyse resistant rbcs that that they are smaller in size and you know trying to come here remember they are somewhere between 80 to 100 you know femtoliters and they are, they are trying to come here and you know they are resistant to the lysing radiation that you are used or they are they are having you know agglutination happening there and therefore they have failed to lyse and again trying to merge in this population so all this could be the conditions if you are this end phase to touch the uh, x axis and similarly on the other ends if this fails to touch whether you know there is a very high leukocyte count you have a large number of circulating glass which are so larger in size that they have failed to touch here so this could also be there this is clearly as i told you much higher peak and you know much smaller peak in this f1 f2 population the f3 has gained height so you would be dealing with a neutrophilia here uh, try to do lot sepsis here here you are dealing with lymphocytosis your f1 population is has achieved a height which is beyond the normal such a picture if if it is there in your elderly you know you could suggest uh, an underlying uh, cltd and try to work up for the same and uh, In, in you know in in accordance to the age whether it is normal or not that you have to keep in mind uh, monocytosis graph would look something like this and an eosinophilia graph a graph would be a little on this side and it would look so um interestingly you know although uh, in uh, wbcs i would say you know we are more used to or more habitual in looking at the scatter grams which i would also discuss in future and we hardly get to look at the you know we are more uh, because you know we get to see more relative kind of population in, in our scan we have to look at them rather than histogram but if you look at these two histogram of wbcs clearly they tell a story so uh, consider uh, a a middle aged ma male who had splenomegaly and you get such a kind of picture your uh, f2 population is widened here and uh, whereas in this case the same history if you have and your f2 and f3 is much higher and f3 has failed to touch the baseline so here you are dealing with a basophilia and eosinophilia with you know your uh, myelo and metamyelo in circulation so you're dealing with something called a cml chronic phase kind of picture but the same has now changed into an um, accelerated or a blast phase where the larger cells are now also in circulation and therefore just by looking at the graphs you can clearly differentiate between a cml chronic phase and uh, a cml accelerated or a blast phase where uh, even larger cells are in circulation and it has failed to touch the x axis
another interesting uh, scenarios that has been reported in literature is that you know sometimes what happens is that you have a circulating fibrin clumps uh, in, in your sample and uh, in uh, this can be easily picked up and this can cause a spuriously high wbc count and uh, what is important to understand here is that you pay attention to the the uh, the ascending limb of the uh, lymphocytic graph so this should have a little a slight tilt and you know it should not be a straight ascending uh, um, uh, limb so if you have get a straight ascending limb that means you are it's a spurious leukocyte count that you're getting in mostly it is because of this large kind of fibrin uh, strands that are uh, that must be there in your sample and once you check then if you get such a straight limb you 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 check that that this is there in the sample you can always ask for a fresh sample and then you know when you get a fresh sample you'll find that this limb has now straightened and therefore uh, the count that you now get is actually the true platelet count when before you are getting a spuriously high leukocyte count and uh, as i said in wbcs we are more comfortable and more used to looking at the scattergram because we are now talking about uh, different kinds of uh, uh, leukocytes which are in in association with each other what is the relationship in, of their counts and you know whether we are getting any merging data and therefore uh, i would discuss the scattergrams in much more detail in wbcs Uh, rather than the histograms and um, uh, so uh, the when we talk of the technologies that the modern analyzers use to give you a scatter graph so you have uh, analyzers from various companies and you know they all have different kind of technologies which are either one or in combination of each other and this is how they achieve their better differentials that are you are talking about three part five part or seven part d series and even higher end models so the three technologies that they mostly uh, use are the volume conductivity scattered uh, technology also called as the vcs technology the peroxidase staining technology which mostly helps in separating the uh, basophils and the fluorescence flow cytometry uh, which you know helps in uh, differentiating uh, uh, even other kind of cells the nrbcs and the other and therefore would give you even a better differential and uh, more differential than you know what is given by the old age uh, analysis so just a brief about what these technologies are though you know i would not be able to do much justice to this technology in this uh, lecture the vcs technology uses uh, detects the volume of the cell by using the two electrodes and uh, it also uses the opacity as a measure to uh, study the internal structure of the cell and then it uses the scatter as the cells pass through and it uses light scatters at different angles and the, uh, based upon this volume the opacity the kind of conductivity the cell has and the kind of scatter it has uh, plotted it 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 calculates the scatter at different angles and tries to separate the cell whereas when you use try to talk about peroxidase staining this is a staining method which uh, uses uh, this basic uh, knowledge in differentiating various cells whether the kind of staining that you have got is very strong medium weak or it has failed to do any staining so basophils are then subtracted from the lymph base so uh, clusters and then this is how you calculate the uh, basophils whereas when you talk about the fluorescence flow scatter it is only using some you know uh, now dyes and then using the side scatter and the side fluorescence kind of patterns to uh, obtain the different channels so uh, final dot plot that you are going to see is actually determined by a number of factors which would be the degree of side scatter the cell has given the degree of forward angle light scatter which is called as fas the absorption of light by each cell and the kind of dyes that you have used whether any so in general the low fas and uh, side scatter are indicative of lymphocytes as the angle of fas and ss the side scatter increases your monocytes will appear followed by your neutrophils eosinophils will have the highest uh, forward angle light scatter and side scatter and the basophils requires a separate uh, window that is called as a different channel and if nrbcs are present and if you don't have used any dye for that it would be usually counted as a wbc and therefore would give you a false wbc count so one channel is there for your differential and uh, uh, of the cells in lympho mono use and neutro and you use a separate forward light scattering channel to just separate out your basophil from your lympho baso cluster and that would be causes called as a baso channel and uh, using all this technology this is how the uh, scattergram would look at uh, 
would look like so your eosinophil would be here the highest side scatter this would be your neutrophil your basophil and your lymphos would be here and monocytes would be here so now uh, just remember this normal uh, cell uh, scattergram and any change in the size of this cluster the positioning of this cluster would help you pick up the abnormal when you are using these scattergrams and this is how the wbc channel looked so we are concentrating in the basophil population here and the entire wbc population would be uh, a separate cluster and if you have any changes this is how we you look your immature grams would come somewhere here blasts and atypical lympho would be somewhere here and uh, again lympho mono and uh, you if you have a very high number of nrbcs this is where they would be located on a scattergram so looking at a normal scattergram here so as i said this is your eosinophils your neutrophils your monocytes and your lymphocytes this is how they look now let's try to look at a few cases so what has happened you you see that your neutrophil cluster has is has is now denser and therefore clearly you are looking at a case of uh, neutrophilia here and uh, if you compare this graph with this here the denser cluster is now the lymphocyte and therefore you are looking at lymphocytosis here so this is kind of a check from your counts also that you know, this is the kind of picture that is depicted in your counts a monocytosis would have uh, its uh, cluster somewhere here where the position of the normal monocytes are and this would be depicted in your counts as well obviously eosinophilia is a cluster which is the highest side scatter and a dense cluster here means you are dealing with a high eosinophil count so uh, look at this graph so what is happening i have just put it here so that you know you remember that your our immature trends were lying somewhere here the basal channel if you see it has thick and and you know there are uh, there are a, a little bit of monocytosis it, this could be a you know uh, Uh, the immature grains more in circulation you could be dealing with a sepsis or you know a picture like this whereas if you look up at this class in uh, this case you have eosinophilia and uh, you have uh, basophilia and all your counts you know much more and this is something of a same in a chronic phase um the other histograms that the uh, newer parameter or the newer analyzers talk about is the reticulocyte histograms how the reticulocyte histogram technology uh, you know it is done it is basically the sample is diluted with then it, it's a dilute dilute and then you are using a fluorescence dye which is exciting your earlier reticulocyte and uh, um, the reticulocyte actually uh, tries to break all your uh, nucleated rbcs into three kind of fractions the one with a low medium and a high frequency reticulocyte and there are different combinations of these which are used to calculate a parameter which is known as the immature reticulocyte fraction Uh, so uh, when you are uh, ratio of high frequency and medium frequency reticulocytes is taken and it is divided with the total number of reticulocytes this is how you get your immature reticulocyte fraction so uh, the most immature cells actually have the highest rna and therefore they have the highest frequency so this is your most immature reticulocytes and as they try to lose their frequency uh, the retic content the rna content they they pick up less of dye and therefore their frequency on the histogram goes less and uh, as a rule your immature reticulocyte should constitute less than 5% of your total number of reticulocytes and uh, if you are uh, seeing any change there if your irf percentage is more than 5% that means that you know uh, your your marrow is trying to produce more of retics and that is a recovery of erythropoiesis so uh, we uh, how we interpret irf is that we try to use it in combination with your reticulocyte count so IRF is also a kind of a parameter, just like your IPF, wherein you are now looking at the marrow from your peripheral blood indices and trying to tell whether your marrow is keeping keeping pace with the kind of disruption of RBCs that is happening outside. So if uh, if you are having a high retic count and you know high irf count you mean that you you, you know that you are dealing with either hemolysis or polycythemia a low irf with low retic would mean aplasia 
but uh, you know your lactic is um, uh, uh, low but you are having a normal irf which should not be so because you know your immature lactic should be more in the conditions when you are having a low lactic count a low and but a destruction in the periphery so this would mean a condition which is something like this erythropoiesis whereas in uh, polycythemia there would be high lactic and a high irf which, which is not needed that means the, now the bone marrow has gone out of control and still it is producing the immature lactic which is not needed also so you are dealing with a condition malignant kind of condition called polycythemia so um uh, uh, uh these are the kind of histograms that we have dealt with so we have uh, discussed the rbcs platelets wbc and the lactic histograms uh, what is important is you know just like any other test that you do in your lab even the histograms require a quality control and uh, the best quality control that could be for your histogram is you know is to keep checking that what you are expecting uh, when you are uh, looking at a histogram and the kind of population that you are expecting the same population you also get to see in your peripheral blood smear Yeah. that would be of course your best quality uh, control but you know you have to keep in mind that uh, there are many pre analytical conditions uh, you know like you know the, the the right amount of anti coagulant the timing whether there are fibrin clots the proper mixing that goes into making uh, the the correct histogram as you know representative of the patient therefore you need to keep a check on all those also before you look at your histograms and um, Mm. Uh, so with that i would uh, just like to say that you know technology is there for us but you know un until and unless we we know how to use the technology to our to the best of our use it it would be it would do us no good and uh, you know before i end this is this is uh, my team at my lab and you know i would really th like to thank each and every person of my lab who has contributed Who actually contributes each day in you know getting uh, making my job easier to getting to look at these histograms and you know uh, trying to bring these cases to you. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Was we really tired? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that was some wonderful lecture. Wonderfully done. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Let's set your camera. Yeah, that's right. And slightly more. Yeah. Right. So there is one question uh, on the YouTube, which Dr. Nilesh Kapadia has asked, which is Menzer's index discrimination. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So uh, you know, Menzer index is also used in 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 addition to what we have discussed in discriminating the uh, beta thalassemia trait from. Uh, uh iron deficiency anemia and uh, yes it helps it does help and uh, what i would like to say is that you know it is not a single parameter ever and uh, while trying to distinguish between iron deficiency anemia and beta thalassemia trait because in india there is always an overlap of these conditions so uh, alone menzer index i would not say that this is such a good tool but yes when you try to use it in combination with either the rdw the rbc count there are other formulas as well the king and phrases and you know all those things then you are uh, uh, to quite an extent able to say that you know you are uh, dealing with whether you are dealing with anti deficiency anemia in overlap or in a true beta thalassemia trait so the cut off there is 13 we use but uh, we have never used it alone always use it in combination yes perfectly right yes. there is another question by uh, dr mamata wants to ask a question do you want didi to ask something an uh, excellent presentation excellent <laughs> presentation uh, excellent i am suffering from corona post corona complication oh. there is many but yes, i am yeah. patiently uh, <coughs> observe your Lecture. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Dr. Mamta Goha Malik Sena is the professor in pathology in Kolkata, oh, and she is a she is a president of the West Bengal Cytological Society. She is a big player in Kolkata. Thank you so much, ma'am. Coming from you, it means a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> There is another question by in the YouTube. Yes, fine. There's another question in YouTube. Avinash Priyadarshini, if slide show fibrinous strand. 
Is yes. this interfere with platelet count? Would this interfere? Right. Uh, so yes, the fibrin. See, the fibrin clot. Actually, when you see it, it, it is actually a rejection criteria for you know accept expecting accepting that sample for any kind of counts for that matter. Because you know your fibrin could have entrapped platelets in them. They could have entrapped uh, RBCs in them, and therefore they would actually cause any hem any any count that is hampered. Why I have talked about leukocyte in particular is because you know uh, sometimes. So we we just look at the high WBC count and we get scared that you know whether are we dealing with uh, uh, some leukemia kind of condition and that is why I have focused on that then. But yes, it does interfere with your platelet count as well because then you'll get a clumps or aggregates of platelets and uh, you'll get a pseudo thrombocytosis kind of picture. Right. Another question by Dr. Avinash: What is the cause of decreased platelet count in dengue, and what is the best parameter to indicate that by histogram? So, uh, dengue, we are talking about peripheral destruction here. So, as I said, uh, platelet uh, thrombocytopenia could result from two causes: whether you are having a decreased production in the marrow, or whether you are having an increase of its uh, destruction in the periphery. So, uh, uh, I don't know the kind of histogram, uh, the kind of histograms or analyzers that you use, but uh, there is one parameter that we really love to look at, uh, and that is the immature platelet, platelet fraction. Even if you don't have that parameter or you don't have that analyzer, what you can do is, you know, uh, try to look at your smear and try to look at whether you are uh, looking at larger sites or giant platelets in circulation. So, if you have that and even if you have low platelet counts, there have been various studies in literature which tells you that, you know, if this much is the number of giant platelets or this much is your image to platelet fraction, you can be sure that within the next 24 to 48 hours, you are going to see an upward trend in your platelet count and that gives a uh, kind of reassurance because you know platelet transfusion in dengue is really tricky one because it may might aggravate the you know underlying condition because it is an it's a hemolysis which is targeted towards uh, platelets and therefore if you have you give it more and you're causing more destruction that would do more harm to the patient and therefore the clinicians just reserve it for those conditions which have uh, you know a borderline kind of you know platelet count so severely reduced that it could cause bleeding until unless that is there they would not like to uh, transfuse in such a case and therefore if you just give them this hint that you know you are seeing giant platelet circulation or your immature platelet fraction is quite high you're giving them a confidence that within the next 24 and 48 hours the patient is going to do much better in your platelet count and therefore you might save uh, an unnecessary uh, transfusion there absolutely right it has a lot of prognostic yes, significance yes. Dr. Avinash has another question. Why in thalassemia hemoglobin is so low and RBC is so high? Absolutely basic. So yes, that's a very basic question about uh, thalassemia. Uh, so we, we have two kind of disorders, a qualitative and a quantitative. And ineffective erythropoiesis is something that is happening when you are having... Uh, this kind of thalassemia kind of defect so you know your your rbc you know you are not lacking in your basic uh, ingredients that you want uh, for production of rbcs but what is happening is that the quality that is being produced is not uh, you know uh, what what one would like and therefore the, the the bone marrow tries to you know keep keep up the pace with the 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 deficiency the anemia that is happening at the periphery but it fails to have a good quality because there is some mutation in the beta globin chain and therefore uh, you know uh, in that attempt the rbc count keeps on going but because that hemoglobin is not qual uh, qualitatively good to transport any oxygen and that is why you get a low hemoglobin there right there is another question uh, by Dr. Avinash. I think he wants all his hematology doubts to be cleared <laughs> by you only. That's great. That's great. That's, that's absolutely fine. Is there any parameter in the histogram to show target cell, acanthocytes and sickle cells? All right. So, uh, you know, every kind of cell that you see in your peripheral blood, any anisopulchrocytosis that you have ever read, all of these have been very well described in the literature. And, uh, you know, they talk about a little bit the, that side. But why I have not included all those in my slide? Because, you know, I just wanted to give you a basic gist of you know what exactly to in in interpret from a histogram the shifts the touching of bases the peaks that you have to concentrate on uh, 
I am not very sure whether target cell alone would cause any. Yes, but if you would look up into the literature, I am. Um, I am sure definitely somebody must have described that paper somewhere there. But yes, I am not very sure about that. By R D W, iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia minor, and uh, thalassemia major. Beta thalassemia. How can you different? Only H B L C is that. So R D W. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So R D W is uh, something that uh, uh, the, the degree of anisocytosis and isopyclocytosis in your iron deficiency anemia, where you are dealing with all kinds of microcytes and uh, uh, you know sometimes you have thin uh, leptocytes. They will be much more potent and much more uh, raised as compared to what you are going to see in a thyroid. So R D W is a very good parameter that would give you a hint that. This is if 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 widen that this is iron deficiency anemia and usually in beta thalassemia trait this would be within normal limit. Whereas in beta thalassemia major when you are talking about a homozygous condition then uh, your R D W will be widened there but then what you are having is that you will have lots of N R B C S in circulation and uh, a much less hemoglobin so that would give you a hint a, a patient who has been requiring frequent transfusions all that history would give you a hint that you are dealing with a homozygous condition. Condition there, a beta thal major. Absolutely right. RDW may not be the only parameter for yes. beta thal man. Yes. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Very nice. Uh, Doctor Avinash now says, "Excellent talk, ma'am. Thank you." Very much. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, yeah. questions. Yes, Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's wait and see if there are any more questions on the YouTube. Sure. Just a minute, please. Sure. No, there are none. And uh, uh, Dr. Ranjana, would you like to ask any question or any Dr. Aparna? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, just a comment. I have no questions because basically I am not a hematologist. But Nidhi, being my colleague, I just want to say that it was such an excellent, extensive, and exhaustive talk on CBCs. I am sure the novices in the field, the postgraduates, and even the uh, the hematologists of some uh, uh, some experience would have gained so much out of this talk. Congratulations, Nidhi, and an excellent. Thank, uh, thank you, ma'am. 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 Yeah, I, 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 would, I, would, I would agree. agree. Every bit of it. There so, is another question by Dr. Nabunita Das from Assam. Would you like to take that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, just one minute, please. Uh, so, in the meantime, while you are reading that question, I would just like to thank you know Dr. Ranjana is a very strong uh, pillar support in the department, always encouraging the you know younger faculty in. Uh, and uh, coming up with the uh, presentations and you know doing uh, research okay. work <laughs> dr ranjana i would like to have you on the platform one day please be some day yeah but uh, i am a hemat uh, histopathologist so oh we have a big yeah, lecture series on histopathology. histopathology we have finished yeah, 165, 165 lectures on histopathology, histopathology. histopathology. Maybe yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. I will. I will definitely get your contacts on Dr. Nidhi. Sure. And get in touch with you. Get in touch with you. Sure, sir. Thank you. There is another question that Dr. Nabunita does. She says, in ET case, is it necessary to try hard to give accurate platelet count? If so, how? Like eight lakhs versus ten lakhs has a diff of two lakhs, but machine or manual values may not be accurate. So I don't think a difference of eight to ten lakh is going to change anything in the management. So you you see the ultimate you know you you would try to make efforts at a point at a uh, at an area where it would make a difference in the uh, management. The same question if you would have asked me you know a difference of count of say one point five lakhs to two uh, you know two point five lakhs to four lakhs you know then that would have made a great difference. But something that is already beyond the range of you know four lakh fifty thousand and well fitting into ET, but it's a count. Count of eight lakh and ten lakhs is now not going to make make much of a difference. Though for your own, uh, you know, um, interests and that you know, uh, the machine all all the machines they have a linearity limit, and once that is crossed, they they all go away, hey buyer. And therefore, you know, trying to put in efforts there, which is not going to be really useful, I don't think that's going to make make much of a difference. Uh, 
Right. There is another. Uh, there is a comment by Dr. Nabanita Das. She says one of the useful talks in the series. So many of my doubts were cleared. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So there is. Uh, let just let me see. Actually, I'm I'm you know copying the war, yes, YouTube yes. comments and pasting it here. Okay. Just taking me some time. That, uh, Dr. Avinash says, "Ma'am, can you share your email?" So that I can clear my doubts in future. <laughs> you had yes. it. Yes, yes. You are so, starting with a fan club now. <laughs> uh, yes, I don't know. Uh, uh, so uh, maybe I, uh, you know, uh, I'll just pass it on in the uh, this YouTube lecture when it is posted. Uh, uh, I'll post uh, there. Dr. Avin, uh, Dr. Avinash, are you in the Telegram group? If yes, yeah. we will share it. We there. will share it there. Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, So there is uh, Dr. Nabinita. Um, after your answer to her question, says so. Signing out with machine value is okay with the clinicians. In that ET case. No, you're talking about that case where the count is between eight to ten lakhs, and you're not yeah, sure whether yeah. it is eight to ten lakhs. Yes, I, I, I know that. Yes, and in all such cases, I always like to, you know, put a note or a, you know, disclaimer kind of thing that you know that the upper limit of the machine. I'm sure your uh, your machine has an upper limit that you you can really get back and check. And once that is crossed, you can always put that note that you know this is the marked upper limit, and it is beyond that, and therefore this is a case of thrombocytosis that would uh, actually. Be all that you need to do. Right, Dr. P. R. Agarwal says autoimmune disorder scenario suggestion from the histogram. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders. So autoimmune disorders, as I said, you can have hemolysis, you can have cold agglutination, and I think we discussed both these hemograms and uh, any any hump there in the uh, on the upper discriminator side where you are expecting a cold agglutinin, which could cause uh, which could be autoimmune suggestion, and again a uh, fragmented RBCs, which are which is making a low discriminator. Fail to touch the bottom line is again an autoimmune suggestion. The width of your RDW, which is telling you that you are dealing with so many kind of, you know, an isopyclocytosis degree, that also is a suggestion to your autoimmune, and all this therefore are suggestions to your autoimmune. Right. I think you must be now tired before you collapse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Uh, Nadeem, once again. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I would like to thank you, Dr. Nidhi, for such a wonderful lecture, a very good lecture, par thank excellence. You. you need a standing ovation for this. <laughs> thank you, sir. So thank you for this. So good, so thank nice. Thank Clear you. Clear about you, every concepts, the way you answered all the questions. Wonderful. We will not let you go. We will catch you again, maybe after a month or so. Thank you so much. For something which really interests you, and so we would like you to be here again. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mamata Gua Malik Sir, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, ma thank you, Dr. Ranjana Swanti, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So many people on the YouTube who have been there, Dr. Nilesh, Dr. Nabanita, Dr. Uh, Avinash, and so on and so forth. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Good night. Take care. God bless everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank Please you. share the PDF of the lecture. We will share with yeah. the students. Thank yep. you. Yep. Bye bye. Yet, bye. Yet you are full and dynamic. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.